Welcome to uh, our, our uh, broadcast this morning. I just We're going to talk about when God rocks your world. And I'm excited about what uh, we're going to talk uh, about the, the uh, encountering God today. We're going to talk about these things. Um, thank you for logging on this today. I uh, just want to talk to you about the subject, when God rocks your world. Uh, and this is a, an exciting, I, this, this goes to the core of, um, of who I am in the ministry and the things I've experienced. And so I want to just share uh, uh, kind of personal things this morning that will really help you. If you are really a person that's open and you want God to use your life, uh, these, these things may really help you. And uh, so I just encourage you, stay on, stay all the way to the end, and, uh, and just let the Lord speak to your heart. Uh, so uh, I just, I just want to talk this morning about a man in the Bible who had an incredible encounter with God. Uh, and and uh, you've probably read this many times, but I, I've, I'm going to just sh- um, highlight this from probably a little bit of a different point of view, uh, and, and uh, it, it will bless you. Uh, the person we're talking about is Moses. Uh, you know, Moses had been born in Egypt. Uh, he was supposed to be killed as a baby. Uh, God just saved his life miraculously. In fact, He was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter and he was raised in a palace. Uh, A kid who was uh, was supposed to be killed was raised in a palace. And um, if you look at the life of Moses, it it was just a lot of favor right from the beginning. Uh, God had his hand upon him. Uh, But you know the story of how Moses, he he killed uh, an Egyptian uh, and, uh, uh, and buried his body and thought, this nobody has seen what I've done, uh, but there's a way of, you know, you can't hide skeletons in the closet. Things can't, things will come out sooner or later. You got to deal with sin in your life. And uh, Moses ran for it. He ran to Midian and he worked for Jethro for 40 years, married his daughter and, and worked as a, just as a herdsman for 40 years. And, um, you know, you can discuss, you know, if, if this was preparation time for Moses or whatever. Uh, but uh, for 40 years, a man who was called was in, was in the desert. And, and um, but then uh, one day he's out in the desert and he sees something very incredible. He sees a bush that's burning and uh, kind of, probably kind of just walks by and, you know, uh, wasn't, you know, you, you do see fires out in the, in, um, in the desert, but he sees this bush burning and then all of a sudden he notices that that bush is not burning up. It's like hours later, it's still burning. And he, say, he says, that, like, this can't be. Something caught his attention. And um, I want to read the scripture to you. It says, now Moses kept flo- the flock. This is Exodus chapter 3. Um, and I'm starting at verse 1. If you have your Bible, just open it up and, and, and read with me. Uh, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to the mountain of God to Horeb. The, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush, and he looked, and the bush burned with fire, but it was not consumed. So Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush is not burning up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called from out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not approach here. Now I just want to just make one comment here. 
you've got to understand, you've got to see, you know, Moses saw this bush burning up, um, and, but God did not begin to speak to him until he had turned aside. It says here, uh, 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 and what, uh, 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 he said, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. So it was only when Moses gave his full attention, uh, everything, you know, uh, he turned aside and started looking at this bush. Just his whole attention was toward this bush. That's when God began to speak. And, you know, there's, there's so many things that happen. You can, if you casually try to listen to the voice of God, many times God will not speak during those times. You know, when, when you're half-hearted, when you're uh, too busy, you're not, you don't have the time to, to spend uh, in, the, in the presence of God. Uh, God. God won't speak during those times. It was when Moses gave his full attention to the, that bush and said, what is going on here? And he turned aside and he started, he probably walked towards the bush and he said, what is going on here? And as he gave his full attention to, the, to, what, to this miraculous thing that was happening, that's when God began to speak. And, and that's one of the first principles. God's not going to speak to you. Many times he, 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 God can do anything, but most times God will not speak when we've got a lot of other things going. He will speak to us when we put all distractions aside and we give Him our full attention. That's when God, where God will begin to speak to our hearts. And, um, and, and that's, that's what happened here. And then God begins to speak to Moses and He says, um, and, and when, when, the lost, when the Lord saw that He had turned to see, God called from the, bush and, uh, from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Uh, here, uh, he said, here I am. He said, don't approach here. Remove your sandals from your feet. Uh, as soon as the, uh, um, the Moses was, was coming close, there's probably this, you know, still he has his full attention towards God, but he's not like taking in the full thing. This is a move of God. And Moses is not seeing that this is really, you know, really God. He's just, he says, don't approach this, this, this bush. Stay where you are. Take off your shoes because the place where you're standing is holy. And this, the seriousness of the moment, all of a sudden, uh, Moses sees he's gotten into a lot more than he thought he was getting into. Uh, this is serious business. Uh, when you're, when God begins to speak to you, it's not just, God making suggestions to your life, or He's saying, you know, uh, you can do this if you want to. When God begins to speak, when you open up to the calling of God and God begins to speak, it's no longer suggestions. When He speaks, you've got to uh, act, you've got to obey. And so Moses, all of a sudden, the seriousness of the moment, man, I am dealing with the God who created the universe and he is speaking to me right now. And so he, uh, he looks at, at, at uh, you know, he, ta- he, he, uh, he takes off his shoes um, and, and the, the land, uh, the ground on which you are standing is holy. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Suddenly, the reality of what was happening hit him. Uh, he hit his face. He said, you know, man, God, I, I, uh, you know, I'm just, I can't stand before you. Uh, he realized this is a God encounter. And uh, then the Lord said, surely I've seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cry on the account of the taskmasters for the, uh, I know their sorrows. Therefore, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them uh, to a land that is good and spacious, a land flowing with milk and honey, a place uh, where of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Now, therefore, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. Moreover, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring forth 
the people of Israel out of Egypt, um, Moses said to God, Who am I that you should uh, that I should go to Pharaoh, that you should bring me to uh, to uh, that you should bring forth the children uh, of Egypt, and and he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I have sent you when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you will come and serve God on this mountain. And I'm just going to read this uh, up to verse 12. Uh, But you see, uh, Moses is all of a sudden hit with the seriousness of what, what, uh, you know, this is God speaking to me. And God says, you know, I've heard the oppression, I've heard the cry of my people. Uh, And this is is a beautiful thing, you know, the cry of people that are going through difficult times, the people crying out to God, those cries that you have cried in the middle of the night when, when you thought nobody was hearing and you just seemed like nothing, uh, God wasn't even hearing you. Uh, God hears those cries. He had heard the cry of, of the people of Israel and, and He said, I, I'm, I'm going to deliver them and Moses, I want to use you. And um, and you know the story. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole text. You can read this on your own time. But um, Moses, you, you know, says, "Lord, I, I, I can't, I can't speak." And then uh, he starts negotiating with God. And then after, uh, after he has negotiated with God, he says, "Lord, send somebody else." And and many people, you know, they have this attitude, "Lord, here I am. Send my brother. Send somebody else to serve you." Uh, I I just. Uh, I'm not, not the right person uh, for this job. But uh, w- what you see here is, is a, it's very interesting. There's a process uh, in the call of God. And I remember uh, back when God called me into the full-time evangelistic ministry. Uh, I was a pastor in Austria. And, um, you know, God speaks in unique ways. He usually speaks when you calm down and you begin to when, you, when you're quiet before God. And I remember, you know, things were just going. I was a pastor. I was running from, from uh, appointment to appointment. I was busy serving the church and, you know, visiting people, taking care of people and uh, uh, trying to build a church. And the Lord gave us success. I mean, the church was growing. Um, but uh, I remember I, I was doing a project, and the, I was doing this actually a, a project for my wife. I was building um, this this table with a little roof, you know, for uh, in our in our garden, just so that we could sit outside and eat, uh, um, you know, lunch together or drink coffee together uh, during the summer days, because there weren't many summer days in Austria. Um, but uh, I was working on this project, uh, working with power tools, and I bought wood, and I was just working, and I had time to think. And while I was doing this project, suddenly God began to speak to me and say, said, Chris, there's gifts that I have put in you that you can never use as a pastor. Uh, there's things that I've put in you, experiences that I've given you, um, things that I've prepared you for that you can never use here in this place. And suddenly the realization came, you know, because I had buried every idea of going into missions. I had, you know, I, I had said, I'm going to be a pastor for the rest of my life. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a church. I'm going to serve God doing this. And uh, um, God had given me success. And it, it, I, was, I was in His will. But God began to speak to me through this project, this wo- uh, just working with wood, uh, where God began to s- just bring a, like a, a restlessness, say, Chris, this is not where you're going to stay the rest of your life. There's something where, that I'm going to use you for, where you, there's the gifts that I've put in you, the things that I've put in you, I'm going to tap into them. And, um, and uh, suddenly, I, it, it just got me going. It just, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Uh, and I remember I, I, uh, I came in for lunch and I was talking to my wife and I said, um, dear, I, I, 
uh, I just don't, uh, you know, I feel like this is not the place I'm going to stay the rest of my life. Uh, I believe that God wants to use the uh, uh, things that he has put in me and I, I can't use them here. You know, there, there's gifts that, that, I've, that, that God has put and these are not you know, natural talents. These are just giftings of God and, and ex uh, experiences that I had even growing up as a child on the mission field. Um, and, and my wife just, just shot <laughs> and said, well, if you want to use those gifts, you're going to have to go into missions. And suddenly it just like, was like God was speaking to me. And, um, and you know, there's, there's, there's phases when God speaks to you, there's emotions that happen in you. And what the first thing that happened is, Lord, this can't be true. You know, I've invested myself so heavily in this church and all my dreams have gone into what I'm doing right now. I've, I'm putting my whole heart into this. You can't be changing this. And uh, the first feeling many times when God speaks to you is, no, this can't be true. Um, no, this, I, I don't want this. I, this is, I, you know, I just, this, this is not what I've, I desire. And that's exactly what happened to Moses. Moses said, Lord, I can't speak. I'm not the right man for the job. Uh, 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 he said, Lord, send somebody else. He, he was trying to wheel his way out of the calling. Uh, this encounter with God, incredible encounter with God, and God is speaking to him and his first reaction is, Lord, I, I just don't want to do this. And many times that's a very normal reaction. The first uh, emotions that you have, the first feelings that you have is, Lord, no, I, I, I just don't want to do this. Uh, and um, I'll, in his grace, God keeps on the pressure. And you know, some people will stay in that place of no for months. Uh, my, my father was a person like that. I've shared the, his, his uh, testimony of how he, he just, he said, Lord, I'll do everything for you, but I just don't want to go to Africa. Uh, I, I don't want to do this. And for three months, he would not say yes to God and had no peace in his heart. Um, but God just was gentle and very patient with him. Uh, many times, so sometimes uh, the quicker you can get past that stage, the better. And uh, for me, the first p part was, Lord, no, I, I, you know, I want to stay in this church. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, but then uh, the second stage is all of a sudden is, you know, is you, you have a turning point where you all of a sudden you accept what God is saying to you and you say, OK, Lord, I, I, I'm going to just say yes. I, I may not like this, but I'm just going to say yes to you because, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. I'm going to be obedient to you. No matter how I feel, I'm going to do what you ask me to do. And that's a beautiful point when you come to that place of obedience where you just say, Lord, I don't understand everything, but I'm going to just say yes to you because you are my Lord. You determine the things of my life. And whatever you say, I'm going to do it. And uh, that was the second step that, that, that happened with me. You know, I was, I was in this project. The Lord was speaking to me. Suddenly, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Lord, I've invested. I'm a, I, I love pastoring. I love working with these people. Um, and uh, suddenly, all of a sudden, the Lord shows you the horizon. It says, Chris, this is what I want you to do. And... Um, the first response, no, Lord, this can't be true. The second response is the turning point where you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to you. And once you do that, uh, it's very, very quickly, all of a sudden, joy comes into the whole thing. And all of a sudden, an excitement, man, I am start, I'm going to do some, the, something new. There's a new a uh, project or a new uh, assignment from God and and suddenly a uh, joy and and uh, comes in your spirit and and you get excited about it and and I remember I, I started getting so excited about going into missions going working as as an evangelist and and uh, and the interesting thing is that you know you get all excited 
and you expect everybody around you to share in the excitement, uh, but many times they don't. And you've got to understand, when God puts a calling in your life, it is a very um, fragile thing. And be careful before you share your uh, vision to, with too many people. Uh, and you've got to be very selective who you share your vision with because the enemy, he has thousands of years of experience and his desire is to tear down uh, your calling right from the get-go, uh, to discourage you so heavily so that you're, you become so discouraged that you just bury that calling. And I tell you, I know of so many people who buried their calling because of discouragement, because people started speaking in, uh, into their lives and, uh, and there were not many encouragers. Let me tell you something. When God starts to speak to you, many times, these times of encounter, these times of calling are very lonely times. Nobody will understand you and, uh, and people will not jump up and down and say, great, man, we're so excited. That excitement in your spirit, uh, it's like, it's only you. And I remember, um, you know, the, the, the Lord was speaking to me, go, go to Africa, uh, start this assignment. And uh, I started knocking on doors and man, I got turned downs from family. Um, uh, you know, I, I was I was thinking, you know, I could uh, join my brother. My brother turned me down. They, they, they didn't want me to come to their ministry. Uh, I, I, I uh, started sharing the vision with my wife. I said, honey, uh, what you said about missions, that's that's exactly that's true. You know, we're going to uh, uh, let's we're going to go to Africa. And uh, and my wife, uh, she was not excited about it at all. She started going through the same process. You know, Lord, this can't be true. Uh, and she, she told me, she said, I know I married you knowing that I would go into missions, but uh, I just can't do it. I can't, I can't go to Africa. I, I can't do this. And, and suddenly, you know, here I am. The Lord's called me. I've had this encounter with God. And, uh, and now, my wife says she can't go with me. And uh, uh, man, I, I, was, I was in a place, I thought, Lord, what? this doesn't make sense. What am I supposed to do? And so I just began to pray, you know. I, I had this excitement. I, Lord, I want to go, but you know, I can't go. All these, all these things are, all these doors are shutting. Uh, my wife doesn't want to go with me. I, I'm not going without my wife. You know, you call. I, I said, Lord, you call families. You're not going to send me alone. You're not going to send, I'm not going to force my wife to go to Africa. You, I said, Lord, if you want me to go, I'm ready to go. But you've got to tell my wife too. You know, you've got to let her know that this is you speaking to us. And, uh, and boy, I tell you, we, we, I went through, through this time. Uh, I got resistance from, from, a lot of family members. In fact, almost nobody could see our specific way with God. Um, even my parents, they, would, they wanted me to go a different way than what I felt was on my heart. Uh, um, it, was, it, was so, it was such a turbulent time. Um, it seemed like nobody would understand me. I was alone. And what, I, what, I've, what I've learned in times of trial times of hardship, the best thing is, is just get into the presence of God. I was doing extended prayer walks out uh, in the Austrian forests. I was just walking and praying and, and saying, God, uh, I'm, I'm ready to go and I want to go, but you've got to make this possible. And um, it was so, so interesting for, it took, took, uh, I don't know how long, I've probably about six weeks of just praying and praying. And, and uh, uh, I told my wife, I said, honey, I said, uh, you, you know, you, I, I'm not going to force you to go and I'm not going to push this thing through. 
Uh, if you don't get a yes from God, then uh, we're not going. And, um, and then I just began to pray. And uh, my wife, you know, she, she jokes about it. She says, you know, I just, I said, well, you're, he's just not going to get a yes from me and we're going to just stay. And, um, and she saw how I was praying and how, how I, was, I was fighting with God. Uh, or not, struggle, just not fighting with God, but just the struggle that I was going through. And, um, and then, she, you know, one time she was going shopping, she was in the car, and, and she saw these people, you know, uh, with dogs. And my wife had had um, an, a, an allergy to animals. Uh, and I mean, uh, it was a, a heavy allergy. Uh, I, I remember uh, seeing her uh, get asthma and uh, closing down, not being able to breathe properly because she was close to animals. Uh, it was a, a, a very uh, strong allergy. And um, as she was driving, she just said to the Lord, uh, she said, Lord, if you really want me to go to Africa, if you really, if this is really from you, um, then you've got to heal me from this allergy. And, um, and she, she didn't think much of it. She just went and did her shopping. And, and uh, a couple of days later, she was visiting a friend. And uh, this friend had a cat. And cats, like, made my, my, the allergies, like, just happen. Um, uh, a cat and a dog, I, I guess. I, I don't remember exactly. But anyway, uh, this, when, when my wife would visit, uh, this lady would always take the dog out, clean up the house, so that my that my so that my wife wouldn't react. Um, and uh, that day, I guess my wife did a surprise visit, or uh, the lady totally forgot about uh, the allergies of my wife. And she came in and visited that lady, and the dog was like, or, or the dog or the cat, I don't remember which one it was, was sitting right there the whole time as they were talking, and suddenly. Um, she realized, I'm not reacting anymore. Um, and suddenly, you know, this was like God speaking to her. God had healed her of this allergy. And, uh, and, and she, because she knew in Africa, we're going to, we have to have dogs. And, uh, and so all of a sudden, that was taken care of. And that's where, where, where all of a sudden my wife just said yes. She came to me, she said, yes, I know, this is God's way. And, uh, but when God, when there's an encounter with God, you know, many people have this idea that it's romantic, it's awesome, it's wonderful, and, and there's no struggle in, 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 the, in the whole thing. You've got to understand that when God speaks to you, the devil will do everything to try to steal away that calling. He will do everything to discourage you. He will do everything. I remember going through that time where, because, because the Lord had um, really spoke to me and to go by faith, to build a faith-built ministry, not go with a mission organization, but go with a faith-built ministry. And a uh, man, I only had one pastor in the whole world that stood with me during that time, a dear friend from Holland. Um, uh, 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 the, actually, it was uh, two, two brothers um, that, from Rotterdam, Holland, Patrick and, and uh, Gerard uh, de Groot. They stood with me during that time. They were the only ones. I was so alone, but they would, you know, God gave me somebody that spoke into my life and, and encouraged me for that period. And I thank God for those guys. Uh, they, are, they are just such a, you know, they were such a, an encouragement during that time. Um, and you know, uh, that it, the, the, when God gives a call, it's, it's, it, it's a fragile thing. But I, I just want to say this, you know, God protected that call and the result has been hundreds of thousands of people making that confession to Christ, making Jesus Lord of their lives. Um, we are right now close to 700,000 people that have prayed the prayer with us. It's, and that's just the numbers we have. There are probably m m more than that. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's, you see the result of 
obedience to God, the result of going the way of God. Uh, it's incredible what God will do. The countless people that were healed, people, countless people delivered from the power of demons. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, it's, it's thousands upon thousands of people that have been healed, delivered uh, fr from, from the power of the devil. And uh, when you look back, when I look back, I just think, God, you're so awesome. Uh, it was such a fragile time, but it was such an awesome time. I thank God that I, I pursued obedience, that I went the way, I surrendered to God, and I said yes to Him. And, you know, if Moses would say the same. You know, when he looked back and he saw the, how, how God had delivered the people out of Egypt, how the miracles had happened, how they had come across the Red Sea, how God met them on Sinai and uh, the miracles God did in the desert and, and all these things and how Moses was able to lead them all the way to the edge of the promised land. Uh, it, it was, it's phenomenal when you go walk the walk of obedience with God after an encounter with God. Uh, but I just want to encourage you, when God begins to tug at your heart, give Him your full attention. I'm going to just give you the, the, the short takes. This is, these are the things that I would, uh, my advice as your brother, uh, uh, when God begins to tug at your heart, give Him your full attention. Take time, go into fasting and prayer, seek the face of God, just be there, give Him time, let Him speak to you because He will and He will give you exactly what you need to hear. And when God speaks to you, decide in your heart, even before you start seeking Him, that I'm going to be obedient. Uh, it may be uncomfortable. My first emotion may be, no, Lord, this can't be true. Uh, but I'm going to just say yes to you, Lord. And when you, when you commit to obedience and you say, God, regardless of what you say, my answer is yes. Uh, I'm going to just be, I'm going to obey you. Uh, that's when God can really share his heart to you. And he will. And, um, and then uh, the third thing is, expect resistance. Don't, uh, don't invite resistance, but expect that you're going to have to press through some things, uh, that the enemy is not going to just rejoice. People are not going to just jump out and, and say, hallelujah, you're called. You're probably, you might get resistance from your own family. You might get resistance from your leaders. You might get resistance uh, from uh, friends around you. Um, you know, they're, they're, the, people will not just uh, uh, be happy with change. People don't like change. So when these things happen, expect resistance and just press through. Don't let discouragement bury your calling. Oh, so many people. I could name names. I could, I, I, uh, I'm not, never going to do that. But I, I know so many dear people. People, dear friends of mine, that buried their calling because of discouragement. And man, it's sad to see what has come of their lives. Sure, they've walked with God, you know, they've, they've gone with God, they've stayed, they've not fallen away from God. But man, they have dealt with things and you just look at their lives and you think, Oh Lord, what you would have done. Uh, you know, I think it'll be a tragic day one day when we get to heaven and people get in front of the great white throne of God and when God, you know, shows us our works and God says, look, this is what you did. Now, I'd like to show you what your life could have been. And when God shows people that film, this is what your life could have been had you just been obedient. Had you not let discouragement uh, tear you down, this is what your life could have been. And man, I believe people will hang their head in shame. Uh, born again believers will hang their head in shame and say, Oh God, I'm so sorry. I know I, this was your call, but I missed it. I, I ended up with plan B. I ended up with plan C. Uh, you know, I, I remember 
uh, talking to Reinhard Bonnke some years ago, and, and, and he, he said, he, he told me of a time where uh, he was getting ready to compromise, and he was, he was actually in the car driving to a place to, to uh, uh, you know, um, to, comp to, to, to just comply with an organization. And as he was driving, the Lord spoke to him, and he said, uh, I think this was while he was driving, but anyway, the Lord spoke to him and said, uh, Reinhardt, if you comply to this, I'm going to find somebody else to do what, you, what you're called to do. And he just turned around and went straight back home. And he said, Lord, don't find somebody else. Use me. And you see the millions that have come to Christ through Reinhard Bonnke and, and now even through uh, his, his successor, Daniel Kolenda, still millions of people coming to know Christ. The impact that a life had made uh, because somebody was not willing to let God use somebody else. He said, Lord, use me. And uh, I want to encourage you. God wants to use you. Your life is significant. Don't let anything hold you back from His calling. When God knocks at your door, and He's knocking right now through this uh, uh, devotion that I'm giving right now, turn your attention toward Him. Give Him your full attention. Listen to His voice and obey. You will never regret it. It may be hard, but you will never regret it. You will look back and you will thank God for what He has done. The Lord has called you. God bless you. Uh, if, you if this has been a blessing to you, share it with, with somebody. And I just want to just say, you know, never forget Christ is your answer.